Hello, BookTube. Recently, David Wiley over on his channel created uh, something called Bookshelf Essentials, where you look at your shelves, all the books that have been piled there, and you think, I love them all, but I love this one more than that one. Uh, what are those books for you? And I've been doing quite a few Bookshelf Essentials. I absolutely love it. I think it's a great idea. Uh, and I want to do one today that has a bit of a wrinkle in it, because, as you're going to see, I'm not looking at my shelves and thinking that about an actual book. I'm instead thinking that about a book that doesn't exist. Uh, but the, the the material for that book definitely does exist, if that makes any sense at all. I'll show you what I mean. My bookshelf essential for today is the first and second volumes of The Common Reader by Virginia Woolf. I have them here in these paperbacks. And you can find them. There, there were mass market paperbacks forever that, that are available. I think at Harcourt here in America did lovely trade paperbacks about 30 years ago of both of them. Beautiful things. And nice floppy trade paperbacks. Of them. These things are not floppy trade paperbacks. I, I have these mainly because they are annotated. And I thought that might be fun. It turns out, uh, it turns out not. Uh, unfortunately. Because who's the publisher here? Harcourt. Okay. Uh, because... Uh, these are collections of literary essays that Virginia, wrote, Virginia Woolf wrote. Uh, the first one, The Common Reader, uh, came out almost exactly a century ago. And they are treatises on literary subjects. They, they are, for the most part, literary essays that have grown out of being book reviews. They're more far-ranging than that. They're bigger than that. They're obviously more important than that. Anyone could have told that right at the beginning, you know, in 1925. Uh, from a seasoned author, the, the Virginia Woolf, who was coming out with the essays that are anthologized in these two volumes, had already written three novels, one of which is great. She wrote The Voyage Out, Jacob's Room, and uh, uh, Night and Day before she wrote, before she came out with the first volume of The Common Reader. And The Common Reader met with, well, it didn't meet with the kind of rapturous reception that she wanted it, but then nothing she ever wrote did. Uh, but it did it did spark, there was enough material to come up with a second common reader, which is the same thing. And these are essays on literary figures, John Donne, uh, George Gissing, George Eliot, uh, Jane Austen, and also more slightly more formless things of the type, that, of the nature that you would give to someone who was a literary presence on their own, where you might want them to just ruminate for a bit rather than the work a day you get 25 pounds and a copy of the book book reviewer that the TLS where they might send you a book and or a package of books you get five books review these see what you can do with them you've got uh, 500 words Virginia Woolf was that kind of a reviewer my kind of a reviewer for years at the TLS took whatever was sent to her did whatever she could with it wrote those and all of those things are saved they're all they're all in collected the collected essay of virginia wolf in the multi-volume set uh but as she was doing that her literary reputation was growing so that she could be indulged in two indulgences that you give to writers like this one is to let them go long and let them be unfocused you'll notice that it's usually the literary poobahs in today's literary journals uh who go off topic and just stay off topic. If you're if you're writing in the, the Times Literary Supplement, if you're the, if you're an editor at the Times Literary Supplement or New York Review of Books, and A. N. Wilson, or the late Philip Roth, the late Gore Vidal, wants to write something for you, you're going to take it because they have name recognition. That's going to that's going to work well in your table of contents, and you're not going to be able to say to them, "Well, could you review the book, please?" They're not going to do it, and you're not going to want them to do it. You might get something like this if you let them have their head. That's what happened with Virginia Woolf. That was indulgence number one. Indulgence number two was that she didn't need to worry about deadlines anymore and was notorious for taking months or even a year to get back a piece that she had been talking to an editor about. Uh, so this, these two books, the first and second common reader, are very different things than what you will find if you were to go to, for instance, the collected essays of Virginia Woolf, volumes one or two. Those are little book reviews. They are actual book reviews of books, most of which have vanished. They are gone well and truly forgotten. 
because there you're not looking for the stuff that your instincts are telling you is significant. You're looking instead, you're taking the stuff that your editor says is due, <laughs> which means you'll be reviewing the swill of the moment. I think they're wonderful. Those book, the book reviews, of Virginia, the actual book reviews of Virginia Woolf, I think are wonderful. But of course, I worship at the altar of these two books. These are incredible. Uh, on Not Knowing Greek, Elizabethan Lumber Room, Rambling Around Evelyn. Um, those are wonderful. They, they are just infinitely revisitable essays of a literary bent. They're just incredible. And they're all over these two collections. I, the reason why I'm not so much sold on these two, I thought originally, well, I, I'm, I'm familiar with Virginia Woolf's career and what she was reading. I'm also familiar with a lot of the stuff that a lot of the books of her time, even if she didn't review them. So I don't particularly, I'd be, I'm curious to know what is in the annotations. And the folks at Harcourt scuppered that interest immediately, almost completely, because the annotations are at the end of the book. <laughs> instead of at the foot of the page, where they belong. If you, you, it's, instead, it's one of those maddening examples where you need to keep two bookmarks going. Because you can't just look down and consult the annotations on that particular piece. A ridiculous decision still happens routinely today, uh, but it, it, if, it's, if, it, if that decision is made in a new scholarly work that I am reviewing, well, okay, then I can rip that decision apart in my own review. If I'm reading for pleasure, no. <laughs> no, that, I'm not even going to bother with it. And so I don't pull these off the shelf anymore. That's one of the reasons. There's another reason why I don't pull these off the shelf. And that gets me to what I started with here, which is about a book that doesn't actually exist which is a one-volume hardcover with thin onion skin pages of called The Common Reader by Virginia Woolf that has, much like The Jungle Books by Roger Kipling, both volumes. And maybe, if, or as long as we're you know, shooting the moon here, maybe somebody goes through and does annotations for those two volumes or just uses the ones in these, only appends them to the bottom of the pages. So you look right down and see uh, when was this assigned, what was the original idea for this, was it a book, was it two books, what are the books? Tell me a little about them and about their authors, especially if they're not known. We can look, just look down at the bottom of the page and see that. As far as I know, that has never been done. You, you people in the UK, if you, if you know of some edition that I don't know about, feel free to correct me and get me a copy. I, as far as I know, the common readers of Virginia Woolf have never been put into one volume. I don't need them to be annotated. They are glowingly great. Annotations or no annotations. They are glowingly great. Uh, I just... These aren't the versions that I want. And neither are the very pretty later paperbacks that were made. They also aren't the versions that I want. And the earlier mass market paperbacks, some of you remember them, they had sort of crayon-y sketches on the cover. I, God bless it, I saw them in so many, I saw, I've sold so many copies of those mass markets. But they blow apart. The, the glue the, on the binding is just not good enough. To be, to be used 60 years later, just not good enough. So... The, they're a great idea, but you can't actually use them. You certainly can't annotate them. Uh, what I want is a big book, and I don't think that's ever happened. If I'm wrong, if, if Penguin Modern Classics, for instance, put these together in one volume, I'd love to know about it, because I'd love to get it. But certainly, platonically speaking, the platonic ideal, I can say that this is a bookshelf essential. Maybe the physical form that I currently have it in, I have the mass markets, I also have these things. Maybe that's not ideal. Uh, but the book itself, I think of it as one book. The book itself, if I, The Common Reader by Virginia Woolf, which is The Common Reader, The Second Common Reader, and a whole bunch of other essays, and a lot of those book reviews, that would not be a prohibitively large book. Even though that's all that material, you, it'd be a nice big thing, but no bigger than a big volume of Kipling or a big volume of John Donne or anything like that. So it would like, it'd be nice to see that, but I, I have not seen that. Uh, but I, I so much recommend these themselves, the material themselves. And maybe you won't be bothered by all the annotations being crowded at the back of this book. Maybe you won't care. I did. Uh, it, in fact, I, I remember the moment where I was reading through the, the second volume here and thought, you know, this is a deal breaker. This is just uh, this is just incredibly annoying. I know these pieces well enough, so I don't need to. No, this is just a deal breaker. I'll hold on to these as placeholders until I find something I really want. Haven't done that yet, but maybe you will. And even if you don't, or maybe it won't bother you. 
if you like reading literary essays and you somehow got haven't got around to the common reader by Virginia Woolf, oh my, oh, oh my, <laughs> give them a try. If you have a little section in your library for books like that, they will quickly become essentials for you as well. I, I, I know some current working critics in the UK and in America who would disagree with me because they like to be brats and because I haven't read what I'm talking about. But I don't think I would get much argument from my fellow critics that our work cannot be done any better than this and has never been done any better than this. I don't think I would get much criticism for that. I hope not. Certainly it's my own opinion. Uh, so there you go. That's my bookshelf essential for today. The Common Reader and the Second Common Reader by Virginia Woolf. <laughs> I'll wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.